of that. This is exciting. Well, uh, as for me, I'm in a state of personal chaos. This is my last day in this apartment before I move out to Long Island for the summer. I will not have an apartment in New York City. So uh, wish me well. How long did that drive take you, by the way, to get back? I drove back on Monday and I thought it was going to be because I had dinner with Fred Mather, uh, Alex Gorbansky, and Rick Smolin, all of whom are mm. Pavilion members at Four Charles. It. And Four Charles is like one of the hardest reservations in New York City. And it's this amazing steakhouse. But of course, I was recovering from a cold from my travels. So I couldn't taste a damn thing, even though oh. like I was aware theoretically, like hypothetically, that it was like I was eating some of the best meat I've ever had. But I couldn't <laughs> taste it. But I... <laughs> Monday was Juneteenth, and I was like, yeah, well, not everybody celebrates, and there won't be that much traffic, and it took five hours. Um, it was a tough, it was a tough, tough day. You were, you were, you were so, to... you were so you bored, do. and you called me. That's how, that's what happened. <laughs> well, should I you call me, too? I, I called both. both. <laughs> yeah. This is Top Line. This episode of Top Line is brought to you by Contract Book. Raise your hand if you love managing contracts. We didn't think so. Contract Book offers a holistic contract management platform equipped to handle agreements of all shapes and sizes. Through automation and centralized management, they unlock the value of your data while creating lovable contracting moments for teams and organizations. Visit contractbook.com to take control of your contracts for good. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. We are. <laughs> this is this is Top Line, CEO of Pavilion Sam Jacobs, CEO of Sales Talent Agency Asad Zaman, CEO of Codopath AJ Bruno. Gentlemen, start your engines. How are you? Ooh, feeling Fantastic. good. So good. AJ, where are you? I'm in New York City. I can see your place from where I am. Actually, the customer. I'm in a customer conversation. They're in uh, the World Trade Center, 49th floor. It's awesome. You can see like all of uh, Manhattan. You can see the Empire State Building, Statue of Liberty. It's beautiful. I feel energized for this conversation. Uh, New York brings it out of me. That's where I am. <laughs> I love that. Asad, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I've been, uh, I went for a very quick run before we recorded. So I feel like pumped up. I feel really good. Oh, I love that. This is exciting. Well, uh, as for me, I'm in a state of personal chaos. This is my last day in this apartment before I move out to Long Island for the summer. I will not have an apartment in New York City. So uh, wish me well. How long did that drive take you, by the way, to get back? I yeah. drove back on Monday and I thought it was going to be because I had dinner with Fred Mather uh, Alex Gorbansky and Rick Smolin, all of whom are mm. Pavilion members at Four we Charles. And Four Charles is like one of the hardest reservations in New York City. And it's this amazing steakhouse. But of course, I was recovering from a cold from my travels. So I couldn't taste a damn thing, even though oh. like I was aware theoretically, like hypothetically, that it was like I was eating some of the best meat I've ever had. But I couldn't <laughs> taste it. But I... <laughs> Monday was Juneteenth, and I was like, yeah, well, not everybody celebrates, and there won't be that much traffic, and it took five hours. Um, it was a tough, it was a tough, tough day. You were, you were so, listen to... you were so you bored, do. and you called me. That's how, that's what happened. <laughs> well, should I you call me, too? I, I called well. both. <laughs> yeah, I would have been very upset if I hadn't gone to call an agent all once. <laughs> well, I was trying to figure out what was the name of those uh, those you know podcasts that you guys listen to. So I listened to the Everything Store podcast by that guy David Cernow or whatever uh, yeah. that summarizes the book, and it got me thinking about Jeff Bezos. And uh, there we go. I was inspired by our conversation from a few weeks ago. He's so cool. He did this for six years and no one knew him. For five of those years, no one knew him. He's a one-person show. He records, he cuts it up, produces it, publishes it completely himself. Only in the last year, the Invest Like the Best guy, Patrick Roshanahi, um, he basically took 
this uh, podcast into their umbrella. I forget what it's called, Colossus. And even then, he's refused all external help. He's still a one-person show. And it took him five years. Now everybody knows him, right? Everybody listens to him. But the, his belief and what he was doing, it was unchanged for those years when no one knew him. He's a very cool guy. It is very cool. And he, I guess it was so he just he reads all of these books and then summarizes them in the podcast. And then you get to like hear about stories of founders. And anyway, I listened to a little bit of the Bernard Arnault one as well. But then AJ told me that one's boring and that impacted my happiness. I was like enjoying it. And then AJ's like, this is it's boring. You shouldn't listen to it. I'm like, yeah, you're not your. <laughs> well, I thought that one was great. Wait one second. Was it the founders Bernard Arnault, or was it the acquired LVMH? No, it was the founders one. I look. I listened to that one in Texas heat. It was 103 degrees. I was running <laughs> when I listened to it, so maybe I was just pissed <laughs> off with the with the situation. And I was like, oh, this rich guy bought his dad's company, and then he acquired all these other companies. I'm being facetious. That guy was relentless and like obsessed with the brands. Like one yeah. thing brand find great brands and the rest takes care of itself that's what i learned from that podcast episode i like great brands that's a good idea brands can be a moat that's what you know that's one of the brand things that, that i mean there are the truth of the matter is that there are very few moats uh in the world it's hard to build long-term defensible competitive advantage that doesn't get chipped away by the market so let's let's start with Asad. you put together a potential docket of topics i think it's always good if you start and you tell us what do you want to talk about we've got SoftBank. Yeah. What's where, where, where should we start? Let's I, start I think, with, yeah. Let's start with this PLG one. I thought it was interesting. I know AJ has taken look, a look at it. So inside partners who we all love and our partners with or have raised money from, um, they've been putting out some really epic research recently. And they just released some research on PLG organizations. And what they did was they looked at these companies and they found, they, they looked specifically at publicly traded PLG companies. And they were finding that the uh, the multiple that these companies was were getting right now was lower than SLG companies. And they tried to figure out why. And in a market where we are valuing efficiency over growth, um, they dug into the efficiency metrics and found that, well, all PLG companies have higher R&D costs than non-PLG companies. And that was there for sure. But you usually expect the sales and marketing costs to be lower than any other form of company. And that kind of offsets the higher R&D costs, number one. And number two is one of the reasons why people like PLG. It's efficient from a sales and marketing perspective. And turns out in their research, looking at specifically these publicly traded companies, that they also had higher sales and marketing costs than their non-PLG competitors, which I thought was just... But I did not expect it. It took me by surprise. I've been thinking about it since the morning. I think I messaged you guys at like 8 a.m. about this. I've been waking up earlier. I hope you guys have noticed my early morning messages <laughs> at like 8.30 in the early morning for me. Uh, but I've been thinking about it nonstop. And one of the things I'm realizing is that maybe it's because of the fact that PLG companies, when they are publicly traded, they have to be trying to sell to upper mid-market and enterprise, you know, Slack initially didn't do that. And when they had to create the infrastructure to do it, their sales and marketing costs had gone up. And it was very difficult for them to do it. It's why they sold to Salesforce for distribution. Um, but maybe that's what's happening within these companies, which has taken up the cost. Whereas when you're private and you are focused on smaller customers, you do have more efficient sales and marketing costs. I'm not sure that's my take on it. But I thought this was an interesting jumping off point. And AJ, you know, you're PLG, so would love your thoughts on this. <laughs> well, I and Pablo, when he sent it to me this morning, I was I just sent the post. It was obviously like, hey, check this out. Make sure you comment. But I actually reading it, I'm like, oh, this is super fascinating. I think there's a knowledge gap, Asad. I think that actually what it really amounts to is the market conditions and like your spend on paid went wildly up. So if you're a PLG company, in a space that's fairly challenging to cut through the noise, you have to find differentiated ways to create the brand advocacy. Now, I, you mentioned us from a PLG standpoint, I would say that like, yes, but we have a sales team and we're definitely yeah. a product-led sales uh, assist motion in that regard. And we look for signals 
Um, the efficiency that we have up front is, is really challenging because we don't know what we don't know. So we can have conversations in a community forum of like, hey, check out GoToPath. But there's a lot of trial and error. So our CAC is going to be pretty high because our sales, we're doing both the PLG and the sales motion. We don't have the efficiency gains of that knowledge. Uh, and so it's really actually kind of taken us, at least I would talk about us, more of a journey to figure out what that, what are those really dials that we need to dial in? And uh, honestly, for CEOs, it's it's also a knowledge gap in terms of like a leadership and making sure you have the right leaders in place to uh, to that know how to handle these efficiencies. So like, you know, a VP of sales that we're looking for right now. Um, I if you hire an enterprise level sales leader, that's a motion they're not going to be super familiar with, and it's going to be pretty expensive. You know, eighty eventually as PLG companies scale, eighty percent of the revenue comes from the enterprise. It's a really interesting stat. So like uh-huh. that's like real scale. Yeah. 80, Kyle Poyer talks about this. 80% of um, PLG companies, when they do, do a deep dive, come from enterprise customers at scale. And so wow. your down market, long tail, you don't want to cut it. Lemton had a post about this. You don't want to cut it because you want to make sure that that word of mouth marketing is still happening. That's where you get the actual efficiency gains in PLG and where you have a product-led sales team selling at the enterprise that will bring down that CAC as well. That's the best of both worlds. It doesn't happen right away. Everyone's trying to do PLG in different ways. They're going to be a total mess at the beginning of this. So wouldn't it be that, so if you look at Figma, they're a really good example of this, where for the first couple of years, it took a while for them to really gain any form of credible velocity. Like their first million dollars, I think was three or four years into their existence, right? You're building the product. Do you know when Figma was founded? What? It's like 2011 or 2012 or something like that. Yeah, 2011. 2011. When did you first hear of Figma? 2019. Two years ago. Yeah. Three years ago. I've been yeah. playing with it, by the way. Like, it's a really uh, buggy platform. Like, the app was That's horrible. Adobe yeah, Adobe. Yeah, like, but I, I think Adobe is trying to get the hell out of it. Like, the EU is really? looking at Adobe's deal. Yeah, Adobe wants to get the hell out of Figma right now. They're probably lobbying on the back end, trying to get this, like, looked at by regulators. Because if you're, if you're Adobe right now, you bought them for $20 billion with the highest multiple possible, right? Like you went against the grain. Jason Lemkin called this the end of the, he called this the bottoming out of the market and now things are going to turn. It didn't. He's called the bottom like seven times. <laughs> um, but the, the idea was that we bind this and this is going to give us a competitive advantage for the future. But then AI it became a new consideration. And I think Adobe has one of the coolest AI products right now. You open up an image, you write something on it and such shit happens to that image. Like Adobe doesn't need Figma as much anymore post AI and they bought it at a really bad price. I'm sure they're happy to get out of it. That said, Figma took a while to take off, but then when it takes off, it really takes off, right? You have hockey stick growth and it's very predictable. It's very, um, and it's less risky than having to hire salespeople. You're just like playing with marketing spend. So it's less risky as well. But the idea was that when over time you gain those efficiencies, so early on you're experimenting and you don't have efficiencies, but then you gain the efficiency. So by the time you're a publicly traded company, shouldn't your sales and marketing costs now be less than your sales led growth competitor? Yeah, I, I mean, the sales, the point that Pablo's article uh, makes is that sales and marketing aren't split up in a public company. So it's really challenging to understand where the costs are for, for both of those. Um, I would agree that you would think that that's the case, but then also think about what's going on that though, if you're a public company, you're looking for other revenue streams. And so you're mm. reinvesting dollars into other product lines that I don't know how the costs, like the accounting black box that exists in, um, in public companies. I mean, to take the Amazon example, they had hid AWS for 10 years yeah. <laughs> before no one had any idea. So like, I yeah. think it's just yeah, right. here, Austin, that like, you just, you just don't know what you don't know. You're trying to dig into these 10 K's and try to really figure it out. That's what hedge funds are trying to do. So I don't, I don't really know. My take is that, uh, you're not the efficient PLG companies today. You have never heard of, and you will hear of in five years from now. That's a really good point. Sam, you're thinking about PLG. Uh, when you read this type of an article, uh, does it give you things to think about? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know if I shared this before, but I, I think I did. This I was talking to the this the woman. Uh, there's a woman CEO, and her husband had this um, point of view that um, you know they had some conversion rate on on free. They had a free they had a free product. They had a free platform, and they converted ten percent of the free users into money. And so then they made the free version, which had been hidden on the website, much more prominent in the pricing page, thinking that they would get all this free traffic, and then they could just apply that ten percent upsell rate to their business. And what they ultimately almost did was drive the company out of business because it turned out that when you made the free experience much more prominent, you were getting different kinds of traffic and you were converting people that would have paid into free users. And so the conversion rate went from 10% to something like 1% and their whole math was completely off. So I, where I come out on it is sort of what AJ was talking about a little bit, which is like PLG, anything new and different Efficiency comes from doing the same thing over and over and slowly iterating and improving. And doing something new and different doesn't generate by definition, right? It's like, first of all, as AJ said, and as the article says, you're going to have much higher R&D because you're just going to need a bigger engineering organization because PLG is going to be core to your product experience, which means that you're going to have to build a lot of shit that's free in order to flow it into something that's paid. So it can't be like an afterthought. And, um, and, and, We've used the word PLG a little bit that I think I'm going to try and push us away from. We have the concept of, you know, an application and 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 we have a new digital platform. And, and uh, I think over the next week, actually, 100% of new members will flow through the new digital onboarding flow that we've built. And, um, and they will create, and so some portion of those people, we get about, I don't know, 250 to 300, um, quote unquote applications, uh, a week. Right wow. now that, um, but they're really going to move from, it's not, it's going to be less of an application to an account creation. Right. And so you can say, oh, that's PLG. Cause there, you've got all these people that don't convert into paid that will now have a free account. Well, I'm not sure that that's PLG. I just know that they create an account. We're going to do email marketing to those people. And, um, and maybe we'll create like a free course or maybe we'll pull out my session on unit economics and make that part of a free experience uh, and put everything else behind like a little lock. So maybe that's PLG, but I, it's not, it, I, I'm just hesitating to call it like core, you know, true PLG because it's not, it's not deeply embedded and I'm not willing, frankly, to the point of like the R and D costs, I'm not willing to commit that many engineering resources to like, I think, for me, the the gold standard of PLG has always been HubSpot, right? Which is, you know, when I started consulting in 2017, uh, my friend Michael Ingram, who runs SalesOps.io, said you should use the HubSpot CRM. So I created, uh, you know, for Sam F. Jacobs Consulting Partners, I created a free HubSpot account, and it's synced with all of my my Gmail and all that, even back then. And that was <clears throat> through um, this year. That was the instance, that was the same instance of HubSpot that we now ran Pavilion on. And wow. it is still the same instance. And that is PLG. That is, and we pay, of course, we pay HubSpot, you know, I don't know, not six figures, but a lot of money. Um, that for me is, that's, I just think HubSpot does so, so many good things. And that's an example where that's true PLG. Is me giving away some content for free, is that PLG? I don't know. I I am of the opinion, sort of to, to the point of AJ's uh, perspective, that efficiency comes from doing the same thing over and over again. And if and trying new things is by definition going to be inefficient and, and certainly not. That's OK, by the way. we got to try new things. This is, by the way, you know, I teach this. Um, I teach this class on unit economics and pavilion for CRO school. And I always say that, you know, uh, your unit economics, your CAC uh, and your efficiency never gets better it only gets worse and yes. people are like well how can that possibly be true you know because everybody's always pushing us to improve efficiency i'm like well because by definition you're trying to grow and by trying to grow you're pushing into areas where you haven't been before you're trying to sell to customers that haven't already purchased because if they'd already purchased they would be customers already so by definition the act of trying to do something new means you're going to be bad at it or you're going to it's going to be more expensive than trying to do the same thing over and over. Long answer to your question, Austin, but I mean, I, I certainly want to email market to people that create a free account for Pavilion that don't convert into paying customers. I'm a little hesitant to call it PLG. 
I think that's a really good perspective. I think there is a lot of confusion around what PLG really is in the market. And I think a lot of really early stage companies, like I, I, I speak to early stage founders a lot, and I've seen a couple of decks for seed rounds. One of them was hilarious. They had a slide on moats or potential moats. It's like, chill, guys. Like, you'll figure this out much <laughs> later. <laughs> like, this is not a today fucking problem. Um, <laughs> relax. <laughs> and then another had like a five-year projection. I'm like, you can torture a financial model and make it tell you anything you want. Doesn't mean it's true and doesn't mean that that's time well spent. Like, just don't, you don't need to do this exercise. Great investors are not looking for a five-year projection when you are just an idea. But a lot of them were like exploring PLG as the core motion without really the understanding that your first million dollars is much harder as a PLG company than a sales-led growth company. And so if you're in a tough market where fundraising is difficult and you need to hit a certain mark to be able to survive, to get the next round, you probably should be doing some door knocking, old school sales to like find that initial revenue from a survival perspective and then experimenting on the side. So maybe where the world is going is that it's not SLG or PLG, it's just fucking sales. And there's a combination of various tactics, some of them with free users converting other shit that's a little bit more traditional, but it's a hybrid combined model that is the right model here versus like going extremely in one end of the spectrum or the other. Yeah. How about awesome. uh, you? Go ahead, AJ. No, I, I'm, I'm going to jump the gun and talk about SoftBank in a second. So I, I, I was, when I saw that pop up, I was excited to talk about SoftBank. I want Sam to finish your, your thought here before. Oh, there's no finishing on the thought. I'm always interested in talking about SoftBank. So SoftBank back. Are they back? SoftBank is back. So I, I, Chas, Sam and I were talking before this and we were saying, I was saying, uh, so that Sam doesn't get branded with the statement. I was like, now if you see SoftBank on a cap table, like that's a disaster. That's like a red flag, right? Like high likelihood for failure of this organization. So today in the morning, I was, I was on Financial Times and Martha Oshu's son, he said, I'm back, I'm back. I have money to spend. I have companies to invest in. I've made 600 inventions and patents. And he just sounded like he was fucking losing it. And so these guys have are looking to get aggressive in the market again. Last time when they were aggressive, them and Tiger, I think, caused a lot of the problems in the market. And I think them wanting to be aggressive is a really concerning sign for me. And so I, I was very unhappy to see that. Concerning. Oh, I like it. I, there's well, two things that stick out to me. One, first off, I'm going to offend all my uh, UT Austin brethren, but I've heard Texas is back living in Austin <laughs> for like 15 years. And, what? UT hasn't won shit in that time. <laughs> no, that's not fair to say, but like, <laughs> it, it, it's interesting to see how that was positioned in the Financial Times. I did really find the, like, we have cash. That's, you know, I, Charlie Monger, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, says this all the time. Like, that's the best investment strategy they have is just you have cash to to basically make moves. And so that I found that really uh, intriguing and interesting, but must have been a pretty, pretty uh, dark times for him over the last he year. He spoke about it. He's like he was shut into a room crying for three or four days. Like he was very open. Like this is where you have to give it to the guy. Like he goes for it, right? Like he's not looking for incremental wins and a little, like he's swinging for the fucking fences and you have to respect people that are doing that. Like you'll find things to point to along the way because when you swing for the fences, like you're going to have some where you knock it out of the park and other times you're going to eat shit. And like he, this was his period to eat shit, right? So he basically a couple of quarters as a draw, um, he came and he just took ownership over the mistakes that they made and the blind spots that they had. Um, and then right now, when he came back and said, I'm ready for a counter offensive, that was his word, counter offensive. Um, is the counter offensive the same basic strategy of saying capital is the scarce resource and I'm going to cut yeah. $100 million, $200 million checks and is that still the same basic idea it's that he's pursuing? We have, we have money. We have liquidated all of Alibaba. Arm is, they own a lot of Arm, right? They own Arm on their balance sheet, not as a venture investment. It's a balance sheet asset for them. So the Arm is about to go public and that's going to be, you know, a huge amount of revenue for these guys. 
And so they don't take all of that money and they don't go into the market. They feel like AI is a is a platform shift and they want to be on the offensive. He spoke about how he, he's been inspired. He's come up with a bunch of inventions. He's opened offices in a bunch of places to file patents for these inventions. So some of it sounds like re- intense. The challenge I have is that one of their big investments last year was a company that had trucks that would drive around. And at the back of the truck, there was a robot that would create pizzas for people. And then you would order a pizza and the truck would come and this pizza had been... And it's like, come on, guys. Like They'd given them like 200 million and that company didn't survive. And so I feel like... Like they just want the biggest bets and there's some things that you should make big bets on. Sam Altman talks about how there is an overcorrection in giving in large fund uh, funding rounds. Like there's some companies that need large funding rounds. If you think about all of Sam Altman's companies, they all required a hundred million dollar round early stage to get going. But then there's some that don't. And these guys did a lot of the second bucket, which is like that company shouldn't get so much money, should have constraints. Uh, let's take it incrementally and they would give these people a lot of money and things got shitty and fucked up and now it might happen again what do you uh what's your outlook for i remember when we were talking on monday on the phone also then you said that aj i didn't share this with you but this is hilarious asad was sad that he feels like the tech recession is going to end soon <laughs> and he, he was sad. <laughs> first off he he's was- he was bittersweet. He's like, I'm going to miss the tough times. I don't. So I would like you to explain that, but also explain your outlook because your point, I guess, here's, here's what I, we, we heard that China's going to start p- pumping, uh, printing, you know, money and pumping it into the Chinese economy because yeah. they've got serious demographic problems and they've got an economic problem. And so I hear that and I thought that's a good thing for the tech ecosystem and that money will ripple through the global economy and maybe maybe we're not as dependent on interest rate cuts from Jerome Powell and from central banks if China starts printing money although yeah it might drive up a little bit of inflation it'll stimulate our businesses but so Asad explain your perspective and then we can go from there you caught me on a weekend I say random fucked up shit on weekends <laughs> but I don't hold by, I don't stand by on weekdays <laughs> no no I'm serious so basically what you said is correct like I think the first thing is that Jerome Powell has in hindsight, done a good job against inflation. You know, inflation is coming under control and the likelihood of this soft landing of sorts from a macro perspective, right? We know tech is feeling more pain than other sectors, but at a macro level, the soft landing is probable. It's the first time in history that a soft landing might happen where the Fed was reactive from a monetary policy perspective versus proactive. So it would be a huge achievement. And then Goldman Sachs gets a star because they were the ones that were saying soft landing is highly likely. They had recession at 25%. Bloomberg at some point had it at 100 and now have it at 65%. So this soft landing is possible because of some of the data points that we've seen recently. And so A... If the if inflation's at four percent, they're probably going to they didn't raise last time around. They probably raised once more, and then that stabilizes. And this whole thing is inflation related, right? Like inflation was aggressive. They have a blunt instrument like a hammer called interest rates, and they just keep taking the interest rate higher till inflation comes under control. Interest rates higher mean that the economy is cooling down and demand is not going to be available and all the implications of that. So for me, it's that I felt that the last inflation reading was kind of the beginning of the end. Um, But as we spoke about last time, this end is not a flip. It took more than a year and a half to get to this stage with inflation. So it's going to take six to nine months for things to start feeling a lot better. My hunch is that by the end of this year, the market feels a little bit more stable. And I think next year and the early part of next year, we start seeing like, ah, things are really improving right now. And so the point I was making to you was that, you know, I feel like I have grown the most when the market was its most fucked up. Um, I have learned the most lessons. I have tested myself. I have grown. The organization has improved. We stress test the business in moments like this. And you make changes and adjustments that set you up for the next phase. And there's a part of me that's like, it's about to end. And I hope I'm taking as much juice out of this experience as humanly possible, because this is going to be what equips me for the next five years. And so one of the exercises I'm doing is I'm actually writing out the principles I've learned in a period like this. Oh, Um, oh, yes. 
right? Like, I think it's really important like to take as much value out of the situation as possible. And so that's that's the part where I'm like, I just hope that I can get as much out of this as I uh, I possibly can. But I also hope that it's party time soon. Um, but I don't want to get into party time without having gotten the value out of this experience was the point. You have, Austin, you have such discipline because I think like while I appreciate the learnings and the lessons, and I agree with them. I am not excited, or I'm, I am excited to get the fuck out of this. <laughs> like, I think like this has been the most challenging, trying, a pressure last two quarters that I've ever gone through in my career. And yeah. this is how we learn outside our comfort zone. That's all great, but I am like, I'm not mentally exhausted. I'm not burnt out. We talked about burned out last uh, last time, and uh, like a lot of the bullshit mechanics behind that. But I think the the challenge is just I am exhausted from trying to bring everyone with me on this journey in a more of a positive way. Like I am done with this. It's just like, okay, like let's continue to focus on the long term. And then people say they focus on the long term. That's not true. Like they're they're the here and now. What are you gonna do for me now? Um, so cool. That's great. But you're usually the like, aren't you like the bearer of bad news in these? Like, aren't you like uh no, I'm the I'm the negative we, one. You're, we you're do. We flip flop a little bit. I we think like, well, it, I think we've been really good about saying this is the actual state of the market and it's not ending anytime soon. This is the reality. Like I'm planning for the next six months to be an absolute shit show. I'm going to eat shit. We're going to fight through the market. Right. So no one's confused about that. Um, but at the end of the day, like we come together once a week and we laugh, right? Like we laugh freely um, and we're able to still fight this fight. It's not meant to be easy, but we've still been able to like if we're coming towards the last six to nine months of this and this is where we are right now and this is how we feel like we should be feeling a little bit tired. We should be feeling ready for this to end. Um, but it didn't break us, didn't break you, didn't break your company, didn't, didn't break Sam, didn't break Pavilion, didn't break me. Um, and actually, we're a little bit better because of it. So, yeah, I, I find that to be very comforting. What's your what's the number one principle? You said you're going to write down, like, give us yeah. the top thing you learned. The number one thing I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot these days is that the problem when the market's really, really hot, like at its absolute peak frothy frothy fucking market when the market is frothy the thing that is your the lowest priority problem the thing that you can't prioritize is probably the thing that you actually have to give more attention to because when the market turns it will be your number one problem and so that's something that i've really taken out of this experience there were things that i deprioritized at the top end of the market and i'd rationalized it and justified it but next time around, I'm at least going to ask this question of myself that this thing that I'm putting low on the priority list, if the market turns, if, if interest rates come up, will this bite me in the ass? And if this if the answer is yes, I'm going to give it more attention than I did last time. Sam, do you agree with this? Uh, I think so. I mean, for me, the number one lesson has been just focus. You know, the thing that it sounds easy, but. I mean, I've learned more in the last six months, nine months of being a CEO than I have at any point in the previous. And what are the lessons? And and it sounds, most of it's unwinding bad mistakes. And those bad mistakes were a lack of discipline and a lack of focus. It was trying to go too yeah. big, too fast, hiring too many people to do too many things and getting the message confused. And even, you know, our too big... We've got two big initiatives uh, right now, and really three. The first is we're bringing chapters back uh, in our city-based communities, and we got rid of them, and that was a huge own goal. And that was like this idea that there's a misunderstanding about what Pavilion is and what the business is. And uh, and then the second is launching our digital platform and getting people migrated over to that. And then the third is executing uh, GTM 2023, our big Nashville event, where we're going to be announcing uh, this new recurring revenue alliance, this alliance and consortium of all of these different companies that, a, that are ascribing to a set of operating principles that we think the best recurring revenue businesses adopt. And we know that Insight is in on it. And we know the sales talent agency is going to be in on it. And we know that uh, Winning by Design is going to be in on it. But for me, uh, these errors were primarily an error of lack of focus, lack of discipline and over hiring. And I'm so, yeah, I mean, I think what I'm excited for, because we're still in this, you know, I call it like the, the chrysalis. We're still in this period of transformation of getting back to these things and, you know, unwinding or rewinding 
mistakes that we've made. But by the fall, what I expect, I, I feel like what we're really doing is pulling, you know, the slingshot back because, and that's really how I've been thinking about this economy, which is do everything you can to shore up, you know, your defenses and your foundation. And so we've a lot, again, in just listing off those companies that we've aligned with, we are aligned with the very, very best companies in the world in our space, including both of your companies, we are improving and adopting, you know, new strategies to bring local connection back on the learning front. I feel like we're very, very well positioned. We have an incredible brand. I mean, last week was the single best week of new ARR, uh, all year for us. Wow. Wow. Um, and that again, so that was because of some mistakes that we unwound, like getting rid of monthly pricing and then reintroducing it. And all of a sudden the funnel starts converting better, but I'm super, what I'm excited for is just, is the, is being bored. I'm excited for Q1 of 2024, hanging out with you guys in Scottsdale, Arizona for the CEO summit and knowing that like, there's nothing to like sort of reinvent. It's just like keep pushing on the existing themes, keep pushing on the machine, and the machine at that point will be well developed. That's where I'm at. I love the slingshot analogy. Yeah. That's a great one. I'm stealing it. I'm taking it. It's not <laughs> mine. Uh, the focus on fewer things. I think that that like that resonates. The focus that but fewer things, and um, you can't. We can't boil the ocean, guys. We can only do, control what we can control. And we talk a lot about this in our KPIs and our metrics and our dashboards and what we're looking at. Um, and, and I talked about this last week in our kickoff conversation. It's been great. I still would say that like, I'm not done with this journey. So maybe I'm, I'm I, maybe Austin's like turning me. Yeah. Let's keep, let's keep eating yeah. shit for a little while <laughs> and we're going to continue to learn. Well, I think uh, uh, Sam said it so well, right? Like there are things we're going to do right now in this stretch of it, right? Because there are phases to a downturn, like the last six months, this six to nine months different, right? So in this period, I think now, if you believe, you know, I'm not an economist, so don't take my word for it. But if you believe that this inflation reading means that there will be maybe one or two more in, uh, interest rate heights. And then after that, that stops. Then the market is at least not going to be cooled down further artificially by the uh, the Fed. And so that creates some stability over time, right? And then that improves conditions. If that's the case, this stretch is the last stretch. And in this period, you want to also position your organization to gain as much velocity when that opening presents itself, right? Because there's going to be this moment. And are we prepared to capitalize on as much momentum as humanly possible at that stage? Right mm -hmm. now, the decisions we make equip us for that. And so this is a really interesting fun period as well from that perspective. Yeah. Well, we VC, I mean, the big bellwether is venture capital has to open up a little bit. And I just don't see it happening until September at the earliest. Yeah. And even then, I think they're going to hold hold the line because they want to, I mean, they're going to want to get deals and the deals are coming at the end of the year and beginning of next year. Yeah, I think the VC market comes back February, March of 2024. It's not coming back this year. Yeah, I, got, I don't know if they're that disciplined. Like, look at how they're investing in AI. Like, I think there's just a few things happen and then they'll start valuations go back up for fundraising rounds go crazy. Like, we've seen it already. We've got uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, wins of the week, shout outs of the week. AJ, give us some. Um, I had an amazing customer conversation today where I, uh, I won't mention the name of the customer, but I did. Uh, we pulled up a deck and went through the things that we're working on for the rest of the year, and every single one resonated with our customer. So shout out to my product team who is uh, kicking ass and taking names. Um, just nailing it like one after another. Um, and so I feel really great and grateful that like we have a lot of, uh, a lot of things to go out and accomplish, but we're working on the right things and Andy Kyle, I'm going to give you the shout out as the director of product, uh, for great job, Andy. Great job. Awesome. Andy. Look at that. Um, a few days ago, we launched our newsletter called the battle card. And the goal for this was for it to be more like a Substack than an actual like company newsletter, like a self-promotion type of thing. So we wanted to show the market that we understand the problems that they're wrestling with and are investing time and energy in, in looking into them and coming back with research and perspective. And so 
I wrote this like myself. My goal is I've been inspired by all the writing Sam does. And I was like, fuck it, I'll write my own. And so I wrote it and we sent it out to 4,100 people. 3,496 of them opened it, published it on LinkedIn newsletters, about 1,500 subscribers in a day and a thousand of them read it. And so feel like that's a nice win. And so that's my win. I love that. That was uh, my my life partner calling. Um, <laughs> I want to give. I is that there's only been. I was just looking at my email. I've only gotten one on July on June eighth. Is that it? Yes, I'm going to send oh. another one next week. I'm taking so my what, time. What's the now. okay? Is there some re, some predictable cadence that we show? Or you just like whenever you feel like it. <laughs> biweekly is the ideal, but like I'm going to be an artist with it. Like I'm I'm uh, going to be less no. like structured vetoed. cadence this that the other. I'm right. going to be the artist here. Yeah. Vetoed, vetoed. You're not going to be like an artist. You're going to be disciplined and consistent. <laughs> I reject that idea. All right. Uh, I'm going to give two shout outs to these are two people that used to work for me that I consider to be sort of mentees, but now they just become friends. And it's just awesome. So last night uh, I met up with Dan Brown. Dan Brown was worked for me at Axial. He's now the CRO of a company of a publicly traded company in London called the Census. He's kicking ass. It was awesome to see him. And, uh, and then we go to Kevin Chu's place. Kevin Chu is the co-founder of Catalyst along with Edward Chu. And there's this great party. And I walk in and see all of these great people. And one of the other people I see is Sam Slevin. And Sam Slevin is the SVP of customer success for AlphaSense, which is now doing over $200 million in ARR. And he worked for me at Axial too. Dan and Slev both work for me at Axial. And it's just awesome to see them become executives in their own right. And by the way, Slev is the biggest fan of Topline you'll oh, ever yeah. meet. And he's like, I was listening to it on the subway and I was listening and I love what you said about burnout and I love what, and um, anyway, it was just, I just really love it when, pe- when you see people flourish, when you see people develop and when you see people rise up. And so I want to give those two shout outs, Dan Brown at a census chief revenue officer and Sam Slevin SVP of customer success at alpha sense, two that. great human beings. Congrats, gents. And those uh, those guys at, at Catalyst are also doing some really fun stuff. Those are those are some those are two gangsters, two as gangsters. you would say, Asad, Edward, yeah. and Kevin, and uh, and Pavilion's going to do something big with Catalyst that we're nice. really excited about. So, right. and just shoring up over two hundred million in revenue. Yeah, they are crushing it. There's a few companies that are doing well, and uh, and I've sent a lot of people there. I sent. Um, I sent Peter Kovacs there. I sent Slev there. I sent Nick Sutejo there. Uh, yeah, everybody good in New York City. They're like, where should I work? I'm like, you should work at AlphaSense because they're a great company. Kivas, that deserves Kivas. some advisor shares at least. <laughs> I, I think it's overvalued at this point. Uh, I mean, <laughs> my advisory shares would not. Anyway, I don't want to say it. It's, it's perfectly valued. Um, guys, I got a call to run to. Great seeing you both. Uh, thank you so much. We'll see you. So next week, actually, next Mark week, Robert. actually, Mark Robert. Not the not the snuffleupagus, not somebody that nobody's ever <laughs> seen. Next week. All right. Remember to keep your laptops open. Yep. We'll talk to everybody next week. Bye, everyone. This episode of Top Line was brought to you by Contract Book. Contract Book's holistic contract management platform allows businesses to scale with accessible, actionable, future-proof contracts. Step into the new era at contractbook.com and take control of your contracts for good. Thank you for listening to this episode of Top Line. To learn more about the trends, news, and developments impacting the world of B2B SaaS, head to joinpavilion.com, where more than 10,000 of the world's top go-to market leaders go to achieve and unlock their full professional potential.